page 18. We were talking about the restoration, movements of God, and different things he was doing. We have here on page 18, it says, In the early years of the 20th century Pentecostal outpouring, those that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit went everywhere preaching the gospel and making disciples, just as the first disciples were commanded. They were not welcome in the majority of the mainline denominational churches, so they started new churches with those of like precious faith. Those churches were not even recognized by the other churches of the day. Then the devil got smart, figured out that the best thing to do was to allow the Pentecostals into the denominational churches because he knew that if that happened, those that had the Pentecostal fire would soon assimilate into the cold deadness of the church. So, See, everybody always thinks that they're going to go back and change their church. You're not going to change it. Okay? It ain't going to happen. So, yep, that's what we do. We just go across the street and start a new one. Amen. And the devil doesn't mind if you have a doctrine as long as you don't have a mission to go along with it. Doctrines tend to fade out. A mission is something that's on your heart that you will keep going. And, and you look at people, you can see Pentecostals or you can see Jehovah Witnesses. Jehovah Witnesses have a mission, even though they don't have truth. And they just keep on going and keep on going and they keep doing the things that they do. So we have to realize if, if in the early days of the Pentecostal movement, both, and, and the only reason I bring that up a lot is because it so mirrors the early days of the church. And we have to realize, I mean, think about this. I, you know, uh, here in, in DBI, we're doing our Dominion Bible Institute now. And one of the things that I'll, one of the courses I'll be teaching is on the pioneers of faith. And we talk about these men and women of God that were used by God to do sometimes some very amazing things. And, but one of my other aspects, and it's along the same lines, is I like to teach along the history of the church and Pentecostal movement and that kind of thing. Just because there's so much that we have lost along the way. And we think Whenever, whenever you lose something, we tend to think we can replace it with information. And information isn't always what you need. Right? Uh, you can tell an alcoholic all day long the steps he needs to make to get free from alcoholism. But he needs more than information. Right? He needs to be totally free because even the alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous, as, as much as they have helped people, uh, they will tell you, you will be an alcoholic the rest of your life. You're always a recovering alcoholic. And that, that may be true for them. It's not truth from God. Amen. Right? God can set you free. Amen. Right? Not, not just maintain. Yes. See, man's idea of dealing with sin or dealing with situations like that is to repress it, suppress it, keep it down, somehow keep control of it. God's method is to remove it, to get rid of it. That's called deliverance. It's called freedom. And so in the early days of the Pentecost movement, and this is what amazed me. Okay, you look at, if, if I said, okay, name uh, three or four denom denominations. Not, not Pentecostal denominations, just mainline denominations. Well, you might say, okay, the Baptist, Presbyterians, Methodist, uh, Lutheran. Yeah, there you go. Right. Four square. Well, they're, they're well. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> Actually, they, yeah, kind of, kind of the Assemblies of God, too. It depends on which one you're talking about, you know, because some are not spirit-filled or full gospel, and some are nowadays. But you take, uh, in, in before, the, before the Pentecostal outpouring in 1901 and then in 1906 uh, out in, in uh, Azusa Street, everybody was mainline Pentecostal. I mean, there, there were things uh, that were happening but no one, it's really kind of funny. Do you know who uh, was considered the Pentecostals of the day? If you said, who's, who is Pentecostal in doctrine? You know who they would have said back in that day before? Well, no, actually, that would have been closer. I mean, actually, it would have been more right. But the, the ones that actually called themselves that were the Nazarene. Imagine that. Nazarenes as Pentecostals. Wow, that's, that's big, Right. And there was a Nazarene church out in uh, Los Angeles that uh, actually called themselves Pentecostal. 
and but they they saw that to mean we are evangelistic because Pentecost spread everywhere. They didn't see it as power. They didn't see it as speaking in other tongues. They didn't see any of that. They just saw it as we go out and try to convert people. And so they called themselves even that. Now, but the main thing about it is if you go back, even let's, let's take a step even further back. Go back to John Wesley. Whenever you were, if you were back in the day, if you were going to walk with God in John Wesley's day, you walked with John Wesley. You walked in what was called eventually the Methodist Church. John Wesley did not want to break away from the Church of England. He wanted to remain there. He wanted to change the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And he found that he couldn't do it. Why? Because it was an institution that had become so set in the ways of doing things that it was not going to allow any outside change. And so one of the things he did, and, and even after he um, was more or less disassociated, you know, in his mind, he never broke from the Church of England. He, he never said, okay, yeah, we're, we're, he always tried to maintain uh, some type of relationship with them. And in the early days, the only way you could serve communion was you had to be ordained by the Church of England. So for a long time, he wouldn't even serve communion in their groups and in the people that got saved. He wouldn't even allow communion to be served because he said, it, it, we have no connection to the Church of England, so there's no grace upon that, right? And then he realized that the Spirit of God was moving in what they were doing, and eventually he started ordaining ministers. He didn't even want to ordain ministers. He wanted, he wanted them to... He, and when he ordained ministers, you know who he ordained? Lay ministers, which means they weren't technically ordained. See, all that, he tried to stay away from that. Now think about that. Eventually, they said this isn't going to work, so they had to start ordaining ministers and set up their own uh, ministerial hierarchy. Right? Nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying that. The, the point is this. <clears throat> we, especially now, I see it in Christians all the time, we still think that we have to have, that, that it has, we have to have something from somebody that goes back to this, and that's going to make us legitimate. And you have to realize, even during the early Pentecostal movement, they had none of that. See, the only, <laughs> in the early Pentecostal movement, there, the, the United States had this thing that if you were ordained, you could get very cheap tickets to ride on trains. And so the Pentecostals had nobody to ordain them because you couldn't just sit down and go, today I'm ordained. You couldn't just do that. You had to be able to go through a process and you had to show who ordained you. So they had no one because they got kicked out of the groups. So even the groups, even the people that were ordained, when they got kicked out, they withdrew their ordination. So they had nothing. So they couldn't even be a real church in the eyes of people. And the, 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 what hurt them the most was that they couldn't get cheap tickets on trains. And yet the whole idea behind the Pentecostal movement was when people got filled with the Spirit, all of a sudden they started preaching. I'm talking just not even ministers as we would think. No, not ordained. Because there was nobody ordained. <coughs> just people got filled with the Spirit and started presenting that message, started preaching to people, started getting people healed, started getting people filled with the Spirit. And eventually they had to go to this guy. Uh, one of them was uh, G.B. Cashwell. And <clears throat> there was a couple of others... Um, well, I'm not going to go into a whole list of them today. But there was one, and the only group that would, and they weren't Pentecostal, but they actually ordained the early Pentecostal uh, ministers, which gave them legal recognition so they could get the cheap train tickets. And that group, the funny thing is, almost all of the early Pentecostals until Azusa Street were all white. Almost every one of them. Charles Parham... <coughs> Uh, you name it, the whole group, all white, until they went to, to Azusa Street. And because <clears throat> William Seymour had been in the meetings in Houston and he went out there and started Azusa Street, and then all of the Pentecostal, white Pentecostal ministers had to go out there and <clears throat> they actually had to get their ordination through a church organization that was not Pentecostal. And that church organization at that time was a, was a group called the Church of God in Christ which was a black organization. And they got all of these white men. It was wonderful. All of these white men had to go, and part of the ordination services, they had to have their feet, they had to get their feet washed. They had to wash the feet of those that were ordaining them, which were all black men. 
And they all had to kneel down in front of these black men and have these black men lay hands on them. Wow. And that was big, especially down in the South. That was huge. Okay? You could go to jail over that stuff. You'd get tarred and feathered over that kind of stuff. And then whenever they went out to Azusa Street, William Seymour said, the, the bloodline has washed away the color line. Amen. See? But the church didn't stick with it. And the church let segregation come in and that kind of stuff. And they, they started seeing that we didn't have love for one another as we should. And so, but the main thing about it, you have to realize is that none of those people, I mean, think about this. Nobody, they, all the Pentecostals had to be ordained by another denomination. Why? For legality's sake. For God's sake? No. Right? But for legality's sake. Now think about that. There, and yet today... Everybody, I mean, I don't know if you realize it or not, but all the early Pentecostal churches, not one of them were started by an ordained minister. Not one. Not in the early, not until 1906, 1907. Then it started kind of growing there. They were all started by people that were nothing more than lay ministers, had no ordination. Most of, many of them didn't even have any type of Bible school or anything. Charles Parham's Bible school was, they found a, a house in Topeka, Kansas, he got the house, went there, basically gave out a call and said, if you want to serve God and you can trust God for every need, come here. And about 40 people showed up and they all moved into that house together. It was a, like a three-story house. They moved there and he said, here's what we're going to do. He said, I'm fixing to have to take a trip. I'm going to go up to Zion. I'm going to go across to Nyack, uh, New York and study and uh, check out these other places. He said, but here's, as I leave, here's what I want you to do. I want all of you people that are here this is the Bible school, and you're the students. And he said, so while I'm gone, I want you to take your Bibles, get together, sit around a table, go through the Bible, and find out what the Pentecostal baptism in the Spirit was. Because they had no clue. This is 1901. This is before the outpouring, before Azusa Street, before all of that. They had no clue about it. And back then, they thought if you broke the power of sin over your life, that was the, the Holy Spirit baptism. And and they actually talked about two works of grace, the new birth and sanctification, which means the old man died. And then later on, they said, oh, baptism of the Spirit, there's three works of grace. And they started going into all these things. So see, all this stuff developed. This didn't just happen. God didn't just come along and put, you know, hand out a book of theology and say, here's the doctrines that to follow. They had to figure this stuff out. And Charles Parham had been a Methodist minister. Many, uh, a lot of them came from all kinds of different backgrounds. And they all gathered in this house. And when he left, they all gathered together and studied the Bible and discussed. Nobody led it. Nobody was in charge. They got together and discussed what the Bible said. And they said, well, this scripture says that. Yeah, but if that's true, then this, and this says this. So that must mean this. Well, well, wait, if that's true, then that would deny this scripture. So they had to constantly adjust their doctrine so that they lined up with all the scriptures they knew. And then finally, when he got back, they, he said, what did you find? Well, we found out that there was always one thing that always accompanied the baptism of the Spirit. People always started speaking in tongues. And this was just before the New Year's from 1900 to 1901. And so they all got together and they started praying. And they said, Lord, we want that. And finally, there was one woman there, a woman named Agnes Osmond, who was 38 years old. And she had already been a missionary on the field. And she said, you know, Brother Parham, I, I think I'm so close to receiving. If you just lay your hands on me, I think that'll push it over. <laughs> and so he, lay, he hadn't even spoken. He hadn't even received the baptism. But he laid hands on her and she took off in tongues. <laughs> received the baptism and then it caused such a great uh, you know, hubbub amongst everybody. The, the U.S. government sent people down to check her out because this was such an unheard of experience. This woman was speaking in languages she had never learned. And they, they gave a list of languages, and then they even had her writing. She even wrote in what they say were other languages, right? And all these, is, that's why, see, we talk about tongues in glossolalia, and back then they didn't believe in glossolalia. They believed in xenolalia, which meant when you spoke in tongues, you spoke a language that is spoken somewhere in the world. And whatever tongue you got, guess what? That's where you were meant to be a, a missionary to. So not everybody was wanting to receive the baptism of the Spirit. <laughs> because when you started speaking in tongues, you were going somewhere. It wasn't even a question. 
See, but we've got this thing all oh, now so neat and, and, and you know, well, you just come down and receive your baptism and speak in other tongues and, oh, there's no responsibility to it. It's just a blessing. See, we've come so far from the standard of the Bible. Right? And, and then it was about 15 years later when they started saying, uh, well, you know, sometimes we speak with the, men, with the tongues of men and sometimes the tongue of angels. So it's not always the tongues of men. So it can be different things. And so they went through this whole thing. All I'm trying to get across is this. We have to realize that somebody somewhere starts. And usually the person that starts doesn't have the pedigree or the credentials that give him any reason why he should start. Right? And then after he starts, then usually the second and third generation, meaning people that studied under that person, then by that time, it's well known enough. And now his signature on something means something, even though it didn't mean a thing before that. You know? But it's because we have this idea that there has to be somebody in charge. There has to be somebody. Some, there has to be some type of, of connection where people have to have this, this historical connection all the way through. You know? And if you talk to, you can talk to the Church of Christ and they, will, they have detailed what they call records of the connections in generations that go back to John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Think about that. The Baptists do too. If you look at a Baptist uh, confession of faith and their uh, bylaws, it says we can trace our history back to John the Baptist. Isn't that right? I mean, think about that. And yet today we got people that know more than John the Baptist did. Now, he obviously he had revelation. Okay, I'm not putting him down. But I'm saying as far as knowing the Bible, they know more than that. Then most of the people in church today, well, I can't really say most, maybe a lot of them, know more than those early Pentecostals did that started the Assemblies of God, started the, the, um, the Four Square Church, all of those. See, Amy and some of them never really went through Bible school. Right? She, she eventually, okay. But and, and even then, she was a missionary before she went to Bible school. And her first husband died over there. And she came back and then ended up starting the Four Square Church. And nobody recognized her. I mean, come on. Be a part of a ministry that was started by a woman back then? No. You know what? The only thing that she had going for her was that she had the Spirit of God backing her up in the meetings. Right? Not, not paperwork, but the Spirit of God. And now we've got people that are well-trained and yet, oh, well, I'm not qualified to start a church or to start this thing or anything. Nobody's qualified. See, that's what we have to realize. No, uh, the only thing that qualifies anybody is, do you have the Spirit of God? That's the only thing that qualifies you. Not papers, not anything else. Now, we have papers because, like we were talking about today, you need them to get into jails. and Well, you don't need them to get into jails, but if you're going to minister there, <laughs> okay, you might know. Okay. <laughs> but, but he realized we had this idea of certain things. And those early Pentecostals, man, they just went everywhere just preaching the gospel. And little groups would come together. And, you know, if you started speaking in tongues, you got kicked out of your church. So you had to go somewhere. So you just found other people that spoke in tongues and just met in a house, which is the way they did it in the book of Acts. And, and yet we think it has to be this certain hierarchy and all that kind of stuff. And it, that, it, what the problem is when you have the hierarchies, eventually the guy at the top of the hierarchy can't touch the people that are coming into the, to the work itself. And it's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be relationship, discipleship, connected, where you're working together, where you know one another. That's why he said know those that labor among you. you know? not, not have papers from them. Know them. And, and that's why we try to tell people, and it's really hard to get across sometimes, but there's not a one of you in here that have been through any part of DBI, and, and, and I, we're, what, we're in our, starting our fourth week, I guess, of DBI, third or fourth week, something like that. How many? Seven. Seventh week? No. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> Seventh week. Wow. <clears throat> well, then, then you are more than qualified, because I was going to say third or fourth week, you're already qualified to start a church. Well, if you're in your seventh week, you should have started two churches by now. Right? Okay? So, yeah, you understand what I'm saying? Listen, you, you, we have to realize it doesn't take a lot to do these things 
it, it, it all depends on what your view of a church is. And if you're thinking of, you know, the first church of the frozen chosen, you know, <laughs> then that, okay, if you need a mausoleum, if you need that and, you know, you need a steeple and you need an organ and all that, then, you know, it, it, yeah, it may take other stuff. But the idea of the church as a called out group of believers who are called to change their area, you really don't need all that. Matter of fact, it's more of a hindrance because then you start having to figure out ways to keep the thing running, keep the lights on, keep the bills paid, all that kind of stuff. Rather, it's just, you know what? All we have to do is reach people. That's all we got to do. Amen? And, and not get something built up. Really, the whole thing I'm just trying to get across to you is just that we have to change our thinking. You know? Does God, what equips you? God. How? By His Spirit. Well, if you have His Spirit, you're equipped. You understand? You may, you may need a, some training and teaching and stuff, but most of it, you can learn as you go. Right? Most of it, I mean, if you know how to get born again, if you speak in other tongues and you receive the baptism, guess what? You're at least ready to get that started. Right? Amen. You go get some people born again, get them filled with the Spirit of God, sit down, start reading your Bible. There is lots of tools to help you understand the Bible. Right? We've got bunches and bunches. I mean, we're, and still, and we're putting out more and more. Why? It's not that we're trying to put stuff out to sell. We're trying to put stuff out that helps people that is wanting to dig deeper into these things so that you can learn it and do it. That's all that counts. And so we're trying to get, you know, if I could get every one of you to start a church tomorrow, I'd be ecstatic. Why? Because this message needs to be out. You need to be teaching it. You need to be talking it to people. You need to bring people into this truth, regardless of who you are. You say, but, you know, I don't, I don't know enough. I don't, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not. There. Who cares about any of that? None of that matters. That's the same thing they said about Paul. They said when Paul is there, he's weak in his speech. His, his, his uh, eloquence is, is horrible. He has nothing going for him. His appearance, his, uh, all of that, everything's bad. And, and yet he was pretty much the greatest apostle in the Bible. And yet, and they said, well, his letters, his letters, they're weighty. I mean, you know, he, he, he writes a good letter, but, you know, whenever he tries to talk, his preaching isn't that great. And they don't even realize, because Paul said, when I came to you, I determined not to talk nice. I determined not to come to you with eloquence of speech. And think about that. And they're putting him down. Well, you know, he, he isn't that impressive. And Paul's saying, I'm not trying to be impressive. I'm trying to be effective. Amen? And that's, that's who we need. We need to get, you know, with all the politics going on, and I hear every one of them saying the same thing. Oh, this is, a, this is you know, we're not, we're not backed by the big money, guys. This is all grassroots. This is all, you know, we're just, we're trying to get back to the people. We the people. It's the people, right? And I, I'm hearing that, and I'm thinking, man, I've been preaching that for 15 years to the church. Get away from the big money things and all that kind of stuff and get back to the grassroots where individual people, where a neighbor reaches a neighbor, right? Not where you have to be some, you know, bishop, grand bishop, archbishop, you know, where you got all these titles. And even back, you know, they had that back in Paul's day too. They called them super apostles. You know, being an apostle, that wasn't enough. You got to be a super apostle, right? And they have to have letters of commendation. And Paul said, yeah, I don't have that. I don't have letters of commendation. Why? Because I wasn't ordained by any man. Jesus Christ himself ordained me. He said, I'm an apostle by the will of God, not by the will of Jerusalem. You realize that? And then what do we do? Well, who do I want to hook up with? Well, I want to hook up with a guy that can get me the furthest down the road and can make me the next super apostle. Well, if you do that, you're going to pay him because that's how they get to be that way. You end up paying dues to somebody somehow and if you don't pay your dues, guess what? You're not recognized anymore. So it's really the money that makes you there, not the equipping of the Holy Spirit. See, so at some point, we're going to have to get back to the reality. This is either spirit-led, spirit-driven, or it's not. Amen? And, and honestly, I'm not interested in the hierarchy stuff. That's, that's a bunch of nonsense. It's whether you can do the job. What are you out doing? So he says here, let me go to the next one. Yep. Let's go to page 19. During the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, many of the Voice of Healing movement began conducting mass evangelism crusades all over the world. T.L. Osborne, great man of God, I met him a couple of times, recognized that he would have tremendous results in a crusade only to return the next year to the same place and not find a single person that had given their life to Christ the previous year. 
He would go in. Multitudes would come down front. He'd go back the next year. Couldn't find a single Christian in the area. Why? <clears throat> he learned something. T.L. Osborne, notice, he recognized or realized that he was not producing fruit that remained. He had instant fruit, but not fruit that remained. He then partnered with his supporters and began planting churches everywhere he held a crusade. He would leave vast discipleship materials with the local leaders. Then when he returned, he would see other churches that had grown out of the churches he had planted. See, he learned. He saw and he learned. And, he, and so he, he fixed it, right? He said, did, did he have a vision from God? Did he have an okay from God to do that? No, he saw that he wasn't doing fruit that remained and he was commanded to have fruit that remained. So he, it was his job to change whatever needed to be changed so that he could have fruit that remained. So he started planting churches. And as he did, then, the, then when he went back, those churches had actually planted other churches and it kept growing. Gordon Lindsay, founder of the Voice of Healing magazine, and some would even say founder of the movement, also saw the need to empower local leaders where crusades were conducted and started his, what they called their native church program. And so everywhere they went, they would produce materials and they would give them uh, little uh, movie projectors. And they had these videos and these movies back then, and they were reel-to-reel -reel type videos. And they would ship those over with them and whenever they would get there, they would show those on a screen on just a sheet hung up. And then there would be people get saved by watching that. And then they would plant a church. And then they would leave the, the materials. And the, the person that planted the church, uh, most of the time, hadn't been a Christian more than a week. But yet they were over the church. Why? Because they were there. And they were willing to give their life into it. You know, if you go back and look, see, this is <laughs> it's amazing. You got these theologians that have spent four, six, eight years in seminary. And most of them couldn't pastor a church if it was handed to them. If they were given a thousand-member church, they'd have it whittled down to five, you know, in, in two months' time. Why? Because they were good at academics, but not at actually bringing help to people. And you look at what the... And it, it, it's a really amazing when you go back and you study even the New Testament. Paul was in the various places, most of the places he went to in Berea, um, Philippi, uh, most, of the, most of the churches he started, you know how long he was there? Two to three months max. Two to three months. He would go in, go to the synagogue, preach about Jesus, get run out of the synagogue. Anybody that followed him out, he'd say, all right, gather up and let's talk. And before he left, two months later, three months later, he had planted a church, 90 days. The time that most of you are here in Bible school, he would have already planted a church and then lead them and wouldn't see them again, sometimes for a year to 18 months, two years. Leave them on their own. He was with them two, two to three months. Every day, discipling them. And then when he left, leave them on their own. That's why he had to write letters. And they go, why were their churches so messed up? They were all brand new. They didn't know these things. And so they had all this trouble. So he'd write letters and say, here's how you fix that. Here's how you fix that. Why? He didn't say, listen, we, wait till you get it all perfect. And then we'll start a church. He didn't say that. He said, no, you're believers. You're born again. Now you're saved. Bam, let's get it started. Your job is to reach your city. And that's what they started doing. Right? And he went around. The longest place he stayed pretty much was in Corinth, probably because they were so messed up. And he was there 18 months. Think about that. And, then, and he would leave them alone sometimes for a year to two years before he even got to visit. That's why he said, we went back through there again to establish the churches to establish them. I thought they were already birthed. And yeah, birth doesn't mean established. Right? You know, you see these signs established in 1934, you know, for a business. That's, that might have been when they were birthed. That didn't when they were established. First five or six or seven years, every business is on rocky ground. After about 10 years, maybe then it's established. It's the same thing with the churches. He went to them and they weren't established. They were birthed but he had to go back through there to establish them in the faith, to establish doctrine, to set things in order. And he would actually go to them and, and tell these people. He said, okay, that's what he told Titus. He said, Man, and, and Timothy both. He said, I put you there. I left you there so you would put things in order. What does that mean? Things weren't in order. Things were messed up. And he said, so you, or, he told Timothy, ordain, and uh, Titus both, ordain elders. Do you realize what, elder, what an elder was back then? 
They've been in the church maybe six months, and they were elders. Why? How could they be elders over a flock of people? Simple. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. <laughs> you don't have to know everything. You just got to know more than the next guy. Isn't that simple? You don't have to know it all. That's why I tell people all the time, I don't even claim to know everything. I just know a few things that work really good. Right? I'm learning. I, I, man, if I thought I knew everything, what, what kind of life would that be? That'd be so boring. You know, now I may act like I know everything, but that's a whole different, you know, that, that's some of the areas where God's working on me. All right. So, but yeah, I still, I'm constantly studying. I'm still learning and seeing these things, but I have truth that I know is established, but now, and then everything I learn actually adds to that now. But now but the whole point is that any one of you could go anywhere and start a church. Why? No, I'm not talking about some, I'm not talking about a 501c3 with all the stuff and all that. No. That, you have to realize a 501c3 corporation is a United States government corporation. You get that? That's why they require the board of directors. That's why they require the paperwork and all that kind of stuff. That, is, that has nothing to do with God. You get that? has nothing to do with it. Right? God sees the church with the, with the elders. He, doesn't, he puts usually a person in authority over that, and he gathers people around that person to cause the vision to come to pass that God gave the person. There's nothing in the Bible about anybody demanding, or let's say it this way, of having a board of directors that tell the pastor of that church how to run that church. Okay? Or what they call a deacon board or anything like that. That's not, that's not Bible at all. You have in the multitude of counsel, yes, there is wisdom. So you have advisors, you have people around you that you trust, but when it comes down to it, you're going to have to answer to God for how you run things. Because right? God puts a person into a position of authority. And he should have advisors, but there's nobody that should dictate to him how this vision should be carried out. Now, if a man's smart, he's going to surround himself with, with good people that have a heart for God and have a heart for the vision. Right? But this idea of a board running things, that's not biblical. Not at all. Right? So, notice here, let's keep on going. Throughout history, the men of God that have changed the world were always men and women that eventually saw the need for church planting so as to produce fruit that remained. John Wesley saw the necessity and started the Methodist bands and societies. Okay? Those were different local groups. William Booth saw the need and built what he called core, which actually the core was actually the people. <clears throat> the actual name for, what he, for his uh, churches at that point were called citadels. Okay? And so he would plant these. Do you know that whenever William Booth, he founded uh, the Salvation Army in 1865, and you have to put some of this stuff in uh, perspective of what was going on at the time. 1865, the Civil War had just ended here. So it gives you an idea. When Charles Finney was preaching his great revivals in New York, the Alamo was under siege. Right? Give you an idea of some of those things, which, by the way, we're in the middle of that time period between February 23rd and March 6th. That was when the Alamo was under siege. So they're doing all kinds of reenactments and stuff down in San Antonio. So if, if you get a chance here, I might want to swing down there to see it. Right? It's pretty impressive. Well, all, that's what was going on. So it wasn't, you know, you picture sometimes these guys preaching and you don't realize what was going on in the world around it. And you go back and look in um, 1776, American Revolution, John Wesley was preaching, setting up the Methodist bands and societies all over. All that was going on at the same time. And we don't always put those things together. And we realize, we think that there were these time periods of world history, <clears throat> and then there's time periods of church history, and somehow they don't work together, but they were always together. And the greatest revivals were usually whenever the world was in the biggest mess. Why? Because people turned to the church. You know, when the things go worst in the world, there's two businesses that flourish. Churches and liquor stores. Because people are going to turn one way or the other for some type of comfort. Right? And we need to make sure that people know if you come to us, you get help. So all this was going on. Um, William Booth, as I said, what was it? In uh, 1877, 78? Yeah, 77 and 78. I have to get, look at the dates exactly. But when he started, do you know that first off he started the uh, East London Christian Revival Society? 
and that was in 1865 is when he first did it. And you know, whenever he was, um, shortly after that, for, for about 10 years or so, a little over that, they ran it like a normal type of ministry because he came out of the Methodist church, so they kind of ran it like a Methodist ministry. And then in 1877, 78, they said, you know, we need a different system. And, and they actually made a mistake one time and it came about. Eventually, though, they decided to adopt the military system that they did. And they said, well, that would make you the general. So we'll call you the general. And I'm here to serve you and to get this job done. I believe in you. I believe God's leading you. So you, you tell us what to do and we'll do it. And so he really assumed a dictatorial type of position. And people did exactly what he told them. And you know that within the next uh, eight months, he had over 81 churches birthed. In eight months, 81 churches. Within a short period of time, um, he, let's see, during that same period of time, he had 160 new ministers ordained in eight months. And 100 of those were people that were converted during that time in his street rallies that they held. So he would go out, get them saved, bring them back to where they would all live together, basically in a barracks type area, and he would train them for two weeks and then send them back out and have them back on the street witnessing, getting people saved, and then they would bring them back, and everybody that got saved, they were responsible to disciple. They'd been saved two weeks, and they were discipling somebody. See, that's the way the church was meant to be. Not, not this, well, you've got to have a, you know, a bachelor's degree of theology before you can say anything. See, we need to get back to that, to where churches are being planted, they're being birthed, they're being discipled, all this is going on, and it could all go on almost under the radar because you don't need buildings to do that. You just need a house to live in. Right. Amen? Amen? So, <clears throat> he saw the need and he built the Corps so as to continue discipling and training Salvation Army soldiers, which were converts that became soldiers for Christ. Now, in this, I give you a summary, uh, which is an action plan. Now, we're going to go ahead and start the next section because I want to get through these. In section four, or session four, it says, covering the earth with his glory. In Numbers 14, verse 21, it says, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So, our first question should be, <clears throat> what brings God glory? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter five, verse 16. Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So, good works glorify your Father. So if he's going to have glory and we're going to bring him glory, then there's going to have to be good works involved. Is that, is that plain? Pretty, pretty simple, right? John 17, 1 says... These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify you. So how's another way that God gets glory? Glorify Jesus. When you lift up Jesus, you lift up the Father, right? So if we do good works and glorify Jesus, which if you're doing good works, you should be glorifying Jesus because you're doing them in his name. So it could all be at one time. John 21, verse 18, says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, when you were young, he's talking to Peter at this point, you gird, you girdest yourself and walked wherever you would. But when you will be old, you will stretch forth your hands, another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. Now this, well, this spoke he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. Now look at there. You can glorify God by your death. If you read Hebrews 11, in many cases there, the people glorified God by their death. So if you're going to glorify God, then we should have the same statement, whether by life or by death, we glorify God. Amen? Now to do that, that means that you have to have principle to stand on. That means that you have to understand what the Bible says, you have to live by it, and you have to die by it if necessary. Right? Do you get that? Listen, your biblical principle can't change based on the climate, you know, based on the economic climate, 
if it's going to cost you something to be a Christian or if it's going to cost you, you know, some type of hardship or whether it's going to cost you with your friends or anything else. Right. You need to make that decision. You're going to walk in truth and in principle regardless. And in the beginning, yeah, there may be some that, uh, you know, you may start with a, a good number and it may dwindle, but then God will build it back up. Amen? Because... It's his job to increase the church. So, then Peter, turning about, sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrays, you, betrays thee? And Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus said to him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Now that's where I was talking about earlier. You need to decide... Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, not try to work out everybody else's salvation. Right? You're not the Holy Ghost for anybody. You got that? Now, you can pray for them, you can help them, but you're not their Holy Ghost to point out all their faults. If anything, pray for them in the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost work with them. So, he says, what is that to thee? What, what does it matter? You follow me. You do what you're supposed to do. Then went this thing abroad among the brethren that, the, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus didn't say unto him, he shall not die. Just what if I will if he tarry till I come? What is that to thee? So it's just kind of finishing up the story. But now look at point B. This is the danger. Not everyone that, this is Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You hear that? Now that goes back to what I was talking about earlier when I said that when people say, oh, everybody that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that right there proves that's not true. Right? It's not the ones that call the name of the Lord in the sense of just calling on his name. It is the idea uh, here. Notice uh, here he says the idea is that we must do the will of our Father, which is in heaven. Many, you hear that? Many. Not few, many. Now, if you look up many in the concordance, you'll find out many is also having to do with the way, the broad way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go therein, right? Few there be that find the way to life. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name have cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Now go back to verse 22. You say, Curry, are you saying we shouldn't prophesy and we shouldn't do much? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the fact that you prophesy and lay hands on the sick and people get healed and you've done mighty works, all that proves is you believe that God can set people free. That's what that means, right? You believe that God can use you. It has nothing to do with your salvation in that sense. You understand that? In other words, you doing those good things doesn't offset the bad things. See, that's this idea. Uh, in, in the church, we have sowing and reaping, right? Sowing and reaping is not the equivalent of karma. Karma is whenever you have good works and bad works and you hope it balances out so that your good works outweigh the bad, and if that's the case, then you're good. That's not in the Bible. You get that? Now notice, he says here, then I will profess to them, I never knew you depart from me, you that work iniquity. So they were, they were doing good works. They were prophesying. They've done many, no notice, and in, and in thy name done many wonderful works. But Jesus said, yep, you're doing many wonderful works. That's great. But you're still working iniquity. You're still in sin, still living in sin, still doing sin. And he said, I never knew you. So what does that mean? That means that they, they could be around it. They saw it. But understand, he said, I, I never knew you. Depart from me. Right? So it's not just, here's the problem. We're seeing a lot of people get activated in miracles. A lot of people get activated in ministering healing. But the main thing, the, the problem is, we're not making sure these people are discipled and we end up producing these kind of people. People that say, Lord, Lord, and never knew him. We've got to make sure that the people we just, that, that we know, we don't just activate them, but that we disciple them and we make sure they know Jesus. Amen? See, people that don't like to be questioned on that, do you know Jesus? Are you, if, if you go after somebody on that, 
they'll get mad a lot of times. And if they do, guess what? That's because they don't know him. Right? If somebody says, do you know Jesus? They ought to be like, oh, are you kidding? Yeah, let me tell you. You ought to be so quick and willing to share your relationship with Jesus. Right? And if you don't want to share it, it's probably because you ain't got one. Right? So, then he says, verse 24, Therefore, because of all that, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon sand. The rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Why? What's the difference? One did the words they heard, the other did not. That's the only difference. Now, Luke 13, verse 23 on page 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We've eaten and drunk in thy presence. Look at there, underline presence. And thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. He says the same thing again. There's this thing about working iniquity that he is really against. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. That's the problem. Now, let's look at the answer. Romans 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which is made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship. Why? For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are you also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he said. <clears throat> he said here, he talks about according to the spirit of holiness, obedience to the faith, but then he says called to be saints. <laughs> called to be saints means called to be separated from the world, to be separated unto God, to live holy, separate lives. Called to be saints. It means you, that's your calling, right? You are called to be a saint. Called to live holy, not just claim that your spirit's holy while your body lives like a devil. Right? <clears throat> then Titus chapter 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the age of men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the age of women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Hear that? Holiness has a behavior. Imagine that. It's not just an idea. Holiness has a behavior. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Why? That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Now, my daughter was doing some study on this the other day where it talks about these women and it talks about how they're supposed to be and obedient to their own husbands. And, it's, and it actually gives, it's a military term that talks about two people marching in step together, meaning that husbands and wives are supposed to be working as a military team in union and together, in like step, moving on into the things of God. 
You got that? Now, <clears throat> finally, well, not finally. Actually, we'll be finally when we come back from this break. How's that? Let's go to break real quick, and we'll come back in a few minutes. <laughs>